I'm going to invite um, Bill and Grace to come and give our first talk this morning. And Bill and Grace are from the Bruderhof community. Bruderhof community spans four continents. It, was start, uh, it began in the 1920s in Germany, is that right? Um, and they are part of the Danthonia, is that how you say it? Right. Oh, yeah, I'm getting it. Uh, the Danthonia community uh, near Inverell, or in Inverell, uh, in, in up, up north. And um, they, out of, the, out of the life of their community, they have so much uh, to share with us, so much knowledge and wisdom. Uh, and their experience in community has also meant so much grace uh, to, to, uh, to give out to the, this gathered group. They're involved in prison ministry, and ecumenical ministry, um, so a lot of great work and we thank them so much for coming and um, I'll hand over. Well, um, it's just terrific to be here. We're, we're very blessed and uh, just to acknowledge what you, you said earlier, Larissa, um, we'll be conducting a, a workshop at Surrender uh, 2017 in March in Melbourne with our brothers and sisters from the Dion community in uh, Brisbane. And we'll be talking about reconciliation based on Christ-centered community, so it actually fits completely in with what we're doing this morning. So we look forward to that and uh, just acknowledge what you brought to us this morning. So um, rather than having the two of us do a lot of talking at the lectern, we'd just like to have a conversation about Christ-centered community. And we'll invite all of us from the Bruderoff delegation to contribute. So we're actually all members of a small urban household in Armadale, New South Wales. And um, we decided to come down together as an urban household. So very happy to be here. And we were asked to um, speak on topics related to Christ-centered community, related to our history, and to present some type of challenge to the group. So we decided to rope all that in together into a sort of single flow. Um, but what I would like to do is, is start out by reading um, the very beginning paragraphs of this, this book here, Foundations, Our Faith and Calling. So 10 years ago, we embarked on a project to try to describe exactly who and what and why we are. And it took five years. And it uh, started in committee, but thank goodness it didn't end there. Where, where it ended was every one of us as, uh, as members was asked to comment on the draft in, in a handwritten response. So imagine getting, oh, I don't know, about a thousand handwritten responses to the draft. And, and it was an open table. I don't like this Bible passage, put that one in. I don't agree with this section, you know, you better put it that way. And so all of that came back and had to be synthesized into what became that very skinny little volume. Um, and so it really starts out where it should. Um, what is the basis of our faith? So our life together is founded on Jesus, the Christ and Son of God. We desire to love him, to follow him, to obey his commandments and to testify in word and deed to the coming of his kingdom here on earth. So that's the bottom line. That is the, the foundation. Our faith is grounded in the Bible, the authoritative witness to the living word of God. Through the Holy Spirit, we seek to be guided in all things by the New and Old Testaments. We hold to the teaching and example of the early Christians and affirm the apostolic rule of faith in the triune God as stated in the Apostles and Nicene Creeds. We thought that was really important to put that in. And the next little paragraph is why we are here today. We stem from the Anabaptist tradition, but feel akin to all who are pledged to full discipleship of Jesus. So really important to have that progression, Christ, the rock, and then the way in which we express our faith and practice, we take our cue from Acts 2 and 4 in the description of the early church. And then we just really love the way the Anabaptists were given this wonderful 
vision of how that church should work and, and won't go into it, but I love Harold Bender's tiny little volume, The Anabaptist Vision. It is the best short synopsis of what Anabaptism is all about. Beautiful little book. So just uh, two more paragraphs from, from Foundations, uh, which are two of my favorite paragraphs in our little book. Church community is a gift of the Holy Spirit, full stop. Church community is a gift. Any attempt to force it into being will produce only a disappointing caricature. Without help from above, we human beings are selfish and divided, unfit to life together. I'm sure any of you who come from communities can say amen to that. I see a few smiles around the room. Our best motives and efforts ultimately prove unsound. As Jesus tells us, apart from me, you can do nothing. We remain sinners, utterly dependent on grace. Beautiful sentence. And I, too, am also dependent on grace. <laughs> so, someone said long ago, it is not good for man to live alone. So... <laughs> And then here's a really important sentence. Yet we have experienced Christ's transforming love. He makes the impossible possible for ordinary men and women to live together in forgiveness and mutual trust as brothers and sisters, the children of one father. Isn't that beautiful? So we testify that Christ has to change us, and then just maybe we can live together in community. At least we have the best shot at it. And that doesn't happen once. Again and again, Christ has to rub those rough edges off us. Um, that's painful. And um, we heard of that beautifully last night. Um, but that's, what, that's the stuff of life. And it's not dissimilar to a marriage relationship where we have to keep saying at the end of the day, I'm sorry, and we'll try again tomorrow. And through the grace of God, we're still together after 31 years. And we'll continue that way. So, it is his spirit that calls believers to a life of love where work, worship, mission, education, and family life are brought together into a single whole. We are convinced that such a life in church community is the greatest service we can render humanity and the best way we can proclaim Christ. So that, that's an interesting sentence, but I really do believe that, that as we live our life together as transformed beings by the grace of God, that that is the greatest service we can render humanity. So in a divided world, we say, look, through Jesus, people can actually overcome all barriers, all differences that were ever thought of in the history of humanity. And the best way we can proclaim Christ, because it's only through him that we can live together. So what we will do now is um, will be an interesting exercise. We will go through our history um, very briefly, but we'll do it in a way that draws together every one of the eight of us in our little delegation. Because as we found out, as we talked together in preparation for this event, all eight of us come from a different stream that has entered the Bruderhof movement. So you think of that as a river actually stemming back to the early church and the Anabaptists, um, one of many rivers um, that have that origin. And then as that flows through history, different streams come to join that, that river. And all relating to this search for the, the pearl of great price. So I'm just going to read Jesus' words on that because that's really at the heart of it. So Jesus says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Our community was founded in 1920 in Germany by the Protestant theologian Eberhard Arnold, his wife Emmy, and her sister Elsa von Hollander. Soon they adopted the name Bruderhof, which means literally a place of brothers. Now Joanne will. Since 
So Everhart and Emmy, the founders of uh, the Bruderhof, are my great-great-grandparents. And together with Emmy's sister, Elsa, they made a radical decision in 1920 to leave their aristocratic home in Berlin and move to the small village of Zanerts. There they embarked on a communal way of life in the manner of the first Christian church as described in Acts 2 and 4. Then because of their many connections with the free German youth movement and the Christian student union, the small community was flooded with thousands of people over the next years and it grew rapidly. So this all began with a revival that swept across Europe, America, and Asia in the early 1900s. Everhart and Emmy were raised as Lutherans, and they were consumed by a burning love to Christ that drove them to the heart of the Gospels. Much to the horror of their parents, they became convinced that baptism as believers was the only valid biblical expression of that sacraments, sacrament, so they were baptized as adults. Following the complete collapse of Germany's defeat in World War I, thousands of young people wanted to break out of the stuffiness of German culture of that time and find truth and meaning in life. The Arnold's residence became the center of intense examination of the New Testament and its vision of a completely new way of life that hit at the core causes of the catastrophe of war. There were heated discussions on issues like baptism, conscientious objection, community of goods, and the relevance of the Sermon on the Mount. By 1920, it was clear to the three that their words needed actions, so they moved to Zanerts. Over the next 15 years, the community's ranks swelled with young people from all over Europe, eventually numbering 150. After Hitler's rise to power in 1933, however, the community became a target of national socialist oppression because of its stand of conscience. For instance, members refused to use the Heil Hitler greeting, serve in the German army, or accept a government teacher in their school. In 1937, the secret police dissolved the community at gunpoint, seizing its assets, imprisoning several members, and giving the rest 48 hours to leave. Eilis. Eberhard Arnold had done extensive research on the early Anabaptists and discovered that the Hutterites were the only branch that had lived in full community, which is exactly what he and Emmy were searching for. So when news reached Europe from the U.S. of the death of two Hutterite conscientious objectors in 1918 due to the abuse they received in prison, it was the first time Eberhard realized that there were still Hutterite communities in existence. Actually, these two Hutterite martyrs, Joseph and Michael Hofer, were my great-great-uncles. This incredible discovery led to Eberhardt's visit to the Hutterite colonies in North America in 19, 1930. During this year-long trip, the Bruderhof was joined to the Hutterite church, and Eberhardt was specifically commissioned to lead his small Anabaptist flock as a mission outpost in Europe. Later in 1937, my great-great-grandfather, David Hofer from South Dakota, was one of two Hutterite brothers who happened to be visiting the Bruderhof in Germany and were present on the very day the Nazi Gestapo chose to surround and dissolve the community. These two brothers courageously told the Nazis that when their forefathers were persecuted, they were often allowed to take what they could carry. As a result, community members were given 48 hours to leave with whatever they could carry. From Nazi files we now have in our possession, it is clear that they were still concerned for their international image at the time. 
The presence of these two Hutterite brothers surely saved the people from a much worse fate. I grew up as a Hutterite in Manitoba. For a long time, however, my parents felt that Jesus demanded more of them than they could give in a Hutterite colony. So to make the long story short, God led my parents to the Bruderhof in 1997. What they found were people who were committed to Jesus and to helping one another to a more Christ-centered life. So back to the brothers and sisters who had to leave with what they could carry. With the help of Mennonite, Quaker, and Catholic friends, all members were eventually reunited in England. And by 1940, the refugee community had doubled in size through an influx of English members. So my grandfather, Peter Rutherford, was raised in a middle-class church-going family in Broadstairs, England. By his teen years, he was repelled by the properness and the hypocrisy of the Church of England. And this, compounded by the drastic inequality and human suffering that he saw in his work in West London, led him to agnosticism. Not wanting to be a part of the... Um, not wanting to be a part of the unjust system as World War II escalated, he began living in various communities with other conscientious objectors. It was here that he heard about the Bruderhof, albeit in a negative context, and decided to see this international community for himself. In mid-1941, he embarked on a 50-mile bike ride to the newly formed Cotswold Bruderhof. In his own words, he came unannounced stayed for three weeks, went away and resisted for three weeks, came back and was held. My grandmother Olive grew up in a privileged family. They were actually heirs of founders of the Manchester Guardian newspaper. In September of 1941, she followed her sister and visited the Cotswold Bruderhof. In the face of the sacrifice, service, love and joy that she saw there, Olive's holidays of skiing in the Alps or traveling Rockies through Canada quickly lost their appeal. As her intentions of staying at the Bruderhof became clear, imagine trading a college training and engagement for sleeping in the Cotswold Cow Barn hayloft and working in the muddy fields in the bitter cold of winter, her father traveled to the Cotswold and staged a hunger strike to last until his daughter left. After two days of talking with her, her father said, I have talked with my daughter, and I have become convinced that she is here because of her own wish to live your life and is not being influenced or persuaded to do this by you. Therefore, I will not stand in her way. Later in October 1942, Peter and Olive's wedding was the first to occur at the new Wheat Hill community. Meanwhile, World War II had broken out, and the British government advised the group either to accept the internment of its German nationals or to leave the country. Determined to remain together, almost all members of the community, mostly city-raised Europeans, emigrated to Paraguay. Three members remained in England and soon were building up a new community there as dozens of newcomers <coughs> continued to arrive. I'm thankful for the three members who stayed because my grandparents then were some of the ones who joined in 1942 in England. Interestingly, John's grandmother, Olive, was one of the first members of the Bruderhof that they ever met. They lived in London where their concern for world peace drew them into the growing peace movement leading up to World War II. It was through reading the New Testament and coming across Jesus' commandment to love your neighbor as yourself that they first started seeking community as an answer to a divided world. They joined a community of 12 
called High House. Their members shared everything, meals, meetings, and bank balance. Unfortunately, my grandparents soon realized that there were tensions in the group, difference in personality and in convictions that they couldn't resolve. As my grandmother said, it is not possible to live together in unity unless something much greater than the peace witness binds us together. At this point, Olive and another sister from the Bruderhof were sent to High House to learn goat milking. My grandparents spent a lot of time with these two sisters and finally decided to visit the Bruderhof. What they found was a small group of people living on next to nothing, but with tremendous joy and enthusiasm for life. It was the love they felt that caught them off guard. They thought, this is surely what Jesus meant. They gave up everything and joined the Bruderhof. They were both 20 at the time. To quote my grandmother again, <clears throat> one can hardly put into words the joy we felt in the faith and certainty of a life together for Jesus. We knew that this life was the life we must live for and fight for the rest of our lives. Meanwhile, in Paraguay, the community spent nearly 20 years as pioneer farmers in a harsh, unfamiliar climate, while also founding a hospital that served thousands of local patients. So this is the point at which my parents encountered the Bruderhof. It was when brothers and sisters were sent from the Paraguayan Bruderhof to the US to raise funds for the hospital that they discovered a network of intentional communities and individuals hungry for an authentic alternative to a world that had produced the catastrophe of World War II. My dad had joined the US Navy right out of high school and served in the Pacific during the war. Convinced by the end of his tour of duty that he would never again be part of the military machine, he married my mother who soon ran afoul of McCarthy-era hysteria because she was teaching concepts such as the Brotherhood of Man in a public school history classroom. Though defended by her principle against imminent redundancy for, quote, spreading communist propaganda, by the close of the school year, she and dad had had enough. Determined not to pursue the American dream, they embarked on a search to find a meaningful existence in some kind of shared life that treated all men and women equally and valued the earth as a place to be nurtured for the benefit of all. Thinking that amidst the rubble of post-war Europe, they would find the embodiment of their dream, they cycled across Europe in 1948. There were some high points, such as spending overnight in the home of future Nobel Peace Prize recipient Albert Schweitzer but they returned to the US still searching. They moved into a loosely structured cooperative in the mountains of North Carolina where dad built a log cabin by hand, still to this day called the Domer Cabin and still being lived in. It was there that they eventually met the traveling Bruderhof brothers and sisters. Through them, they met Jesus and the long awaited answer to their search. Within a matter of months, my parents joined the Bruderhof in 1954 at the newly found Woodcrest community in rural New York. It was there that I was born three years later. Dad was one of the thousands who refused to go to war, even against Adolf Hitler. Though I grew up the son of US missionaries in India, he eventually rebelled against pervasive Christian hypocrisy under the British Raj, a view that only hardened later as ministers blessed the arms of war. So dad became an agnostic. Mom grew up in a small farming community in rural New York. Even as a young child, she instinctively felt that the Jesus of her Wesleyan Methodist faith was a man of peace 
and no follower of whom could go to war. It was only when a scholarship enabled her to attend Cornell University that she met like-minded young people, including my dad. They were married less than a month following the bombing of Pearl Harbor. With the approach of war, dad dropped out of this Ivy League institution to milk cows in a poor cooperative community in Appalachia, to which after several years in the camp set up for conscientious objectors and a term in prison as an absolutist, dad and mom moved. The point was to make a positive contribution in the battle against poverty and injustice. Although dad was involved early in the civil rights movement and later marched with Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., all was not well among those living in this believe what you like intentional community. Things began to crumble and the members embarked on a full-on search for the truth, capital T. Dad's idea was to start with the Gospel of Luke and then carry on with the foundational texts of the world's major faiths. They did not get halfway through Luke before each was met by the reality of Christ. Since that was all that had separated them from the brooder of brothers and sisters they had come to love, Dad and Mom moved from the mountains of Georgia to Woodcrest in New York. My birth in Virginia only temporarily halted their progress and they became Bruderhof members not long after their arrival in 1957. So, Catherine. So, my parents were born in 1959 and were high school sweethearts in a small town in Oregon, which is the west coast of the United States. They married shortly after graduating, and as middle class Americans, they lived by the motto work hard and play harder. Both my parents were non believers. My mother left the Catholic Church as soon as she could at the age of 18, and my dad was an atheist. Through a difficult family experience in the late 80s, my parents experienced a conversion. They visited all manners of churches, house groups, Bible studies, and their search for a way of truth and love, but remained unsatisfied as mainstream Christianity did not seem to offer what they were seeking for. During this time, the music of John Michael Thibault and Keith Green's album, No Compromise, had a major influence on them. Previous to their conversion, they had played very loud, hard rock music, much to the annoyance of some of their neighbors. Following their conversion, they apologized to these neighbors, who were members of an intentional community called Cedar Ridge. My parents began fellowshipping with Cedar Ridge. However, Cedar Ridge was collapsing as some members wished to live by faith, while others wanted more financial stability and structure. And going back in time a little bit, in 1983, the Bruderhof was again in need of renewal. As Pastor Heinrich Arnold wrote at the time, does making jam for one's neighbor and receiving jam in return really fulfill the call of the gospel on our lives? Though he was dying in 1982, he felt an answer lay in sending a couple on mission, and Grace Ann and his parents were lucky enough to be sent. They visited the West Coast, and on that visit, they visited Cedar Ridge. A few years later, many from Cedar Ridge, including my parents, traveled across the country to visit the Bruderhof. On arriving at the Bruderhof, they were overwhelmed by what they found. What struck them was the love and sense of genuineness they felt in this group of people trying to live out Jesus' teachings every day. In the following years, many from Cedar Ridge were drawn to the Bruderhof by the longing to live completely for Jesus. After four more years of seeking, my parents became members in 1994. Okay, and Maylene can end it off. So my parents joined the Bruderhof from the Hutterites in the 1990s in a search for a church where there is unity and constant renewal and repentance. And this same search for renewal is mirrored in the early years of the Hutterites when my ancestors, the Kleinsassers, first joined the Hutterite church in 1755. 
The early years of the Hutterites were characterized by periods of intense persecution and extreme efforts to convert them to Catholicism, so much so that most Hutterites fled to Romania. There, after a number of years, they ceased to live in community, and the original writings of the Hutterite elders who had pointed them to the practice of, of the apostles and early church were no longer read among, among them, and their original zeal and fire for Jesus had almost died out. Meanwhile, back in Austria, the Catholic queen was becoming increasingly alarmed at the number of Catholics converting to Lutherans. As a result, she deported nearly 300 Lutherans to a town not far from where the former Hutterites were located. My ancestors, the Kleinsassers, were part of this Lutheran church. While in this town, some of the Lutherans came into contact with the former Hutterite members and they discovered some of the old Hutterite literature and discussed them together. Because of this, the Lutherans became convinced that communal living was required of Christians. They accepted the Hutterite faith and practice, including community of goods, as colonies of Hutterites were revived across Europe. As this story illustrates so powerfully, the threat of revival and renewal that we have been talking about today has been a continu continuing theme throughout history and it continues to challenge me today. So there you see uh, from, from multiple different streams, and, and if you would pick any, any dozen of us um, from the Brew Row, if you get a whole another dozen set of, of streams um, that involve uh, Nigeria, um, involve many countries in, in Europe, uh, some are born in Africa or India, um, Asia, uh, China, um, Korea, and um, each each stream entering the the river though represents this personal search for the pearl of great price, and then collectively, as we heard yesterday, um, living in community as as in a marriage relationship is is constantly a matter of um, repentance, revival, and renewal. So talk about the three R's, um, those really sit at the very heart of, of our life together. And each of us um, here today is on a journey, all of us in this room. And there are no birthright members in the Bruderhof, so each of the eight of us too has had a, a personal experience of Christ and would tell a different story in terms of how we became members ourselves. And so, I hope in all that we've shared this morning, uh, you've gotten some sense of, of what gets us up in the morning, uh, sometimes with the help of the others in the house. <laughs> but we, we have a, a great deal of joy in it, and um, in, our, in our session a later this morning, we'll, we'll also tell about some of the personal experiences in prison ministry and, and other activities that involve us with our neighbors in Armadale. And, uh, and, and keep us seeking and searching. And uh, God willing, that search won't end until our death. Um, and so thank you so much for being uh, with you all today. Really appreciated our conversations. And uh, thank especially, I, I really want to thank the people who organized this event. It's a heap of work. Let's all give them a round of applause because they won't do it themselves. <laughs> Before, before you sit down, um, if we can pray for you, that would be fantastic. I think um, <laughs> well, all of us feel, uh, I, th I think I speak for everyone, um, you know, challenge inspired, all those words we keep using, um, but genuinely so, uh, by not just what you have to say, but by your life together. And um, it's easy for us to just want to receive things from you, wisdom and all the rest, but I think um, it's important that we also remember that, as you say, you need prayer like all of us, and so we would love to pray for you. I'm going to ask, can I get Gary? <laughs> Will you come and pray for Bill and Grace and, and the whole community?
today, we just want to give thanks, Lord, for the work that you do through us as people in reaching out to others in community. We want to thank you for the example that you give us that we can follow. We know that we grow through pain and hurt as well to come to a period of joy. And we've seen that in the life of the Bruderhof. We want to thank you, Lord, for them. We want to ask your blessing upon them. May you reach out. May you enrich others around them. May they see a, a life of simplicity, a life of faithfulness. May they also see a life of growth and discipleship. So, Lord, we ask a blessing upon the Bruderhof, not just here but around the world. May we join in their lessons. May we also join in the joys that they have. And we ask this in your name. Amen.